Is there more to midlife than just getting through it? Absolutely. Welcome. I'm your host, Debbie Cunningham, jazz artist turned midlife mentor. And I'm here to say to you loud and clear, it's time for your midlife crescendo. Well, hey, friends, welcome to the last day of September. Today, as this episode drops, I am in Pennsylvania, helping my parents after my dad's pacemaker surgery, driving him to the follow-up appointments and cooking for my mom and dad. I'm so grateful to have this flexibility in my life to serve them in this way. I know some of you are also in a caregiving season, and hey, we are going to talk about that in an upcoming episode of the podcast. That being said, I've been a bit behind on interviews for Midlife Crescendo, so this week we are doing a repeat of the third episode I recorded of the podcast way back in January 2024. I chose this episode because it actually has a lot of pertinent information that might help you in this upcoming holiday season. I mean, Christmas is less than 100 days away. Whether you are perimenopausal and starting hot flashes, night sweats and fatigue, or are postmenopausal and realize your body has seriously changed after menopause, this refresher episode is for you. It is one of the most listened to episodes, and we have lots of new listeners to Midlife Crescendo too. So welcome to the party, friends. Our guest today is Melanie Eddy, who is a certified therapist, speaker, and midlifer herself. Last January, she was expecting her second grandchild, and now is thoroughly enjoying her role as Yaya in double time. We talked about our changing capacity in midlife, physically, mentally, and emotionally, so you can see how it may apply to this crazy holiday season, with Thanksgiving and Christmas not too far off in the future. So pour yourself your favorite beverage of choice and listen in to my insightful conversation with Melanie. Welcome, Melanie. I'm so glad to have you here on the podcast today. Well, I am just so excited to be here, Debbie. I'm actually like giddy inside. I'm just (laughs) this new thing that you're doing. So I am I'm just thrilled to be here. Well, I'm so glad you're here. Melanie and I have been, I just read her bio, but Melanie and I have been long, 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 long time friends, like over 30 years before we were married, before Derek and I were married, Melanie and I have been friends. So we have a long history. We've watched both of our children grow up. And so uh, Melanie is a dear friend, but she also is an uh, um, amazing therapist, mental health therapist, as you just heard. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today, our changing capacity and the kinds of things that women talk to you about midlife. But first, my first question to every guest is tell us something unique about you that is not on your bio. Okay, well, I gave some thought to this and I'm like, oh my gosh, I was was thinking about my answer. I'm like, if this isn't a midlife cliche, (laughs) (laughs) so here we go. To all my pickleball lovers out there, I know that you're out there, ladies. Um, So last summer, I discovered pickleball, and I absolutely love it. And um, it's something now that I do regularly, and um, I know everybody makes jokes about it and and this and that. But you know what? I, I really enjoy it. And that's so, awesome. Yeah. So it's um, very competitive. So, you know, that's been fun. And my body loves to tell me about all the new aches and pains and <laughs> injuries. <laughs> so this fits right in with midlife, doesn't it? Absolutely. I love that. That's funny because uh, Derek and I have talked about trying pickleball now that we're older. We haven't done it yet, but we will. And I know your competitive spirit. So I I want to get good before I play you for sure. <laughs> oh, you know it. Oh my goodness. You know, it's, um, no, on a serious note though, I, I think it's really important in midlife to continue to be achieving mastery in an area. It keeps our brains sharp and it keeps us well. And so it's really been great. I love it. I even got the little pickleball backpack and I have pink oh. balls. And oh, nice. That's awesome. I, I haven't invested in the outfits yet, but uh, it's coming. It's okay. coming. 
<laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, that's awesome. I'm sure we have a lot of listeners who love pickleball. So yes. I have a lot of friends who love pickleball and we just haven't jumped on that pickleball bandwagon yet. <laughs> anyway. Oh, good. Okay. So here we go. All right. So we are talking about midlife. We're talking about um, our changing capacity midlife this week. And I know that you speak to a lot of women in your practice. Is there a specific recurring theme about midlife, especially uh, that you've heard from your women in your practice? What seems to keep coming up? Yeah, well, I, I think it's kind of that. And this is for me, too. I'm 58 years old, so I am in midlife, midlife. And so I think it's that, you know, sense of like this realization and this shock of like, oh, my gosh, I I can't do what I was able to do before, you know, regarding like physically or even, you know, even bigger emotional capacity, being able to juggle it all, um, you know, kind of like that shock of. I'm just not able to do the things I could do in my twenties and kind of coming to a place of acceptance about that. And what does it look like now for me to do all the things or all the expectations um, that maybe other people have of me, or even more importantly, what we put on ourselves as women. Oh yeah. I mean, I think that that is the, probably the hardest reality about midlife. Is that all of a sudden, all the things we used to do, we find our body aches more when we do even the exercises, the normal things we've always done, but also dealing with the fact that all of a sudden we cannot do, we can't juggle everything. We can't burn the candle at both ends and actually still be running on full capacity because it's just not there anymore. And that's a tough realization emotionally, I think. That when you finally, you move to midlife, you're, first of all, you're tired all the time. Like, what the heck happened? You know, and that's our changing estrogen and all the things that are happening in our body. But it's really hard because, and then we want to supplement with something that's going to get us back to that 20-year-old body. And I think there's there's a segment of midlife where we have to learn how to accept, hey, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. And like, how do you encourage women to get to that place of acceptance? Because I think that's the first key, acknowledging what's happening and then accepting this is a normal passage of life. Yeah. And I, and I think too, like, I know this might sound odd, but there's really a grief around this. This is, yeah, there's a grief process around it. Like, I mean, just before you and I came on here today, I said to you, well, I'm going for an MRI because I tore my rotator cuff and I'm sure pickleball didn't help, right? And, <laughs> yes. And I kind of, I'm feeling sad about it, right? Because like, I, I can't play right now and I might be facing surgery, but it was like, it hit me in the gut being so active and strength training and all this stuff. And then like, you know, my body's just, it was like a shock. It was almost like, aren't I still 25? It was like, there's like a denial. I know. And even my husband and I joke about this all the time because I'm also 58 and we joke about, and he just turned 60 yesterday. He had his 60th birthday. Happy birthday, Dirk. So we're at this point where we go to bed and we wake up with injuries and we go, what the heck happened overnight? Like, did I sleep wrong and my back is out? Like what the heck happened? And it's just a huge change and a huge shift. And you're right. I think there is a grief around it. And and how do, how do you process that kind of grief? I mean, it's normal grief. It's normal. Like, like life has changed. Our bodies have changed. And you can take injections and do all the things you choose to do or supplements. But the truth is our body is aging and we have to learn to like kind of assess, okay, I just can't do these things anymore. And just balancing that and then dealing with the grief around that because there is a sadness. And I I think it's great that you brought that up because I think there is a sadness to, I just can't do what I used to do. And I think that's kind of a hard thing to process. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts around that, about processing that? Yeah. No, I I agree with that. And And I think one of the best things that we can do as women is to stop keeping it close to our chest hidden, like having a platform like this where we are giving it a voice, we need to talk about it. 
We need to talk about it and say, hey, you too, how about you? Or are you experiencing this? Like, right. we need to be able to talk to one another about it, right? right. We don't feel so alone in it. And um, I mean, there's so many topics. I mean, you know, like just the whole menopause topic, I, I know at some point we'll get into that, but like part of capacity is also emotionally because, you know, brain fog is a real thing for a lot of women in, in midlife. And, um, you know, some women will say like, I just, I don't have the capacity to, you know, to like remember things or to keep up with the expectations. Like for me, I mean, I'm in a place now where I'm pushing through the denial and I'm letting myself feel the grief, but I'm also kind of like, I ask myself questions like, like this Christmas, for example, I used to do soup to nuts decorating, soup to nuts, right? Like every picture would come off the wall, everything would be decorated. And I just felt this level of tired this year. And I was like, I said, Mel, what do you have the capacity to do? What do you feel like? And what I had the capacity for was maybe decorate in a little corner here or something over there, but I didn't go all out because eventually all that has to come down. Right. Exactly. And um, so, you know, that's one of the things I'm learning to say, like, you know, on the daily, what do you have the capacity for? Another thing is like balancing friendship in, in midlife and, and, you know, having the capacity to say yes to all the different you know, maybe lunch dates or, oh, I want to get together and talk to you and like that kind of stuff. Right. And, and learning how to make decisions around how, just how you use the time that you have. Yeah. I think that is so important. I'm glad you brought up holidays because I think that it's real easy when we get to midlife, like I've always done things a certain way. And so I have to keep doing it, but you're right. The capacity, the fatigue level, the brain fog, all of that is so real in midlife. I certainly have experienced that myself. And I'm finally on the other side of menopause a few years. And I'm finally feeling like a little bit more like myself again and feel like I can think better, you know, and but one of the things that I have learned to do is really shift into the same question asking of myself. Hey, Debbie, I know you always did things this way because my brain goes, I've always done this. The kids love it. Now I yeah. have grandkids and they love it. And But I'm like, what needs to go? What do I need to say no to so I can say yes to other things? And we're going to be talking about that down the road on the podcast about boundaries learning to say no to what's not serving us so that we can say yes to the things that will help propel our this new season forward. As women, we say yes to a lot of things, a lot of expectations, because it facilitates other people's expectations of us. Mm. We, we don't want to let people down. So I think that's kind of in the middle of midlife. Changing capacity is learning like, you know what, I'm not enjoying life saying yes to all of these things, how do I begin to say no? I still decorated, but not the way I used to. But my whole family was in this last Christmas. And my, my, I have one sister who wasn't able to come and a nephew who wasn't able to come, but I had 15 at my house and nine who were here for five days. So I had, there was a lot of cooking and prep work for several weeks in advance. But I wanted to enjoy the holidays not just be exhausted through the holidays serving everyone. And yeah. I thought to myself, what's important to me? And I think this is a shift midlife with our changing capacity. You have to take stock of, okay, what do I enjoy? What brings me joy? Because I want to enjoy my life daily. And then what do I need to let go of? Because mm -hmm. it just exhausts me. I mean, I remember when my when my old OB went through menopause and changed her practice because she said all of a sudden when she went through menopause personally, she said in the middle of the day when I didn't have a client, I was laying down on a gurney taking a nap. And she yeah. said, I realized then, oh, I, I need to help my patients reassess. You need more sleep or you need whatever it is they need or nor rest time midlife. And she said, I realized the reality of it as a doctor. And so I realized like napping people 
laugh like, oh, you know, my parents take naps now. But I mean, sometimes you need a 20 minute power nap to get through the day. I mean, that's just part of the changing capacity. And so it did make a difference. And I enjoyed the holidays. I found great joy and I didn't feel like I was just in the kitchen all the time or just serving everyone. But by changing what I always did to what I felt like was the best choice of my time. And, and, it, and it's important. I think it's really, really important. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I think one of the questions that we're not used to asking ourselves as women is what do we need? What do we need? What do, like, we're always thinking about, well, what does, you know, this person need or that person need or our children needs? And it's really important to be like, for me, like, I've had to really tune into, you know, going through menopause has brought a, like this new level of like irritability. And I'm just like, oh, I can't stand it. It's just like, oh, I don't want to be this person. But I've learned to say, okay, Mel, you're feeling irritable. That's a signal. What do you need? And one of the things that you just mentioned is rest. Like, I think as women, we have to really ask an honest question. How do we feel about giving ourselves rest? What is our thought life around that? What do we tell ourselves about that? Right? Do we give ourselves permission? Um, yesterday afternoon, I, I happened to have an afternoon and, and my granddaughter, I'll tell you what, I lay down under a blanket. I woke up slobbering. I was so tired. I mean, I, I needed it. I was exhausted after working and seeing clients. And so I think that we need to check in and be like, are we giving ourselves permission for rest? And um, asking us those questions. I think that's so important because I do believe that a lot of women feel guilty yeah. when they rest. Do you want to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, I think a lot of times what I see, and you know, I'm not trying to be all clinical on you, but a lot of times we can find the roots in that going back to our family of origin or maybe what, what we watched our mothers do, right? Or the work ethic, right? Like it was like you pushed through, right? You, you know, rest was like something that you didn't do. Maybe rest was viewed as, well, you're being lazy. You know, some women who have trauma histories will have this sense of restlessness because in childhood or as a teen, if they weren't doing something or producing, they were made to feel guilty or less than. The good news is, is that that's something that you can, you can change. You can create a new narrative around that. I know I had to, I, I can remember laying down or resting. I, you know, I felt like I'm doing something wrong or I should be productive. I should be doing something. And actually, you know, rest is essential. Rest is, you know, I heard, um, this was so good. I heard um, a, a pastor say that rest is holy that God created rest. I was like, oh, good. Well, that really gives me permission because if God says to take a nap, I'm taking a nap. Right. It is important. And you're right. God rested. Isn't it interesting? That's in the scripture that yeah. God created and then God rested. And I think that sometimes in our society, we are hardwired to believe that productivity is the only thing that matters. And when, of course, European cultures, a lot of European cultures are much more um, focused on rest. You know, my daughter lived in Germany three years. And so I started to see just the differences in their communities and how they work out of rest. Mm -hmm. They work out of rest, like in the middle of the day. They've, there's We went to Italy this past um, spring um, for an early anniversary trip. And one of the things I noticed, like, as a traveler, you have to know what's happening in the culture that you're yeah. visiting. And like from two to four, everything's closed, sometimes later, because they have these long afternoons where um, they shut down and then dinner doesn't even happen till starting at seven o'clock into late into the night. And it's this crazy change of perspective, but they they value rest in a huge way. And they they, you know, so it's amazing to me, just the differences in culture, but I think it's really, really important. And definitely, I will say for myself personally, going into midlife, I saw a huge change in how much rest I needed. 
And at first I felt guilty about it. Like I'm not being productive. I have so yes. much to do because, you know, our to-do lists never end. Yeah. And so we have to kind of go put a cap on it and go, this is how much I got done today. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. And I think that's huge for women because we don't always feel that way because it does feel like it never ends. Right. And actually, physiologically, we probably need more rest because I don't know about you or the ladies listening, but I'm not sleeping through the night. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Right. (laughs) I'm waking up. I'm waking up. Oh, maybe four or five times. I mean, you know, just disruptive sleep, no matter what you try to do. And when you do wake up, it's like the scroll rolls out of all the things that you need to worry about and think about. And it's just right. So it's almost it's essential to try to find, you know, a pocket of rest. And I guess if you can't during the week on the weekend, make it a priority, make it a, you know, nap Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon or, you know, but yeah. And, um, it's, it's important, but I definitely noticed that I feel like I, I need, I need more sleep and I'm getting better at at giving my, myself permission. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you talked about that a lot because I wasn't asked you personally how you felt about all those things and how it applied to you, but you talked about how you have to assess your own physical body, what's happening, and that you're giving yourself permission. Now, a lot of women struggle with that, I think, uh, and giving themselves permission for what they need or asking for what they need. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. um, I mean, I think that we have to, so one of the things we have to ask ourselves is why is it hard for me to, to say no? What I find in my practice is a lot of women will be like, well, you know, they'll, they'll be, they'll be disappointed in me or, you know, they, they fear disappointment. And I find myself saying this over and over again. And I say this to myself, just because somebody feels disappointed in you, it doesn't mean you've done something wrong. And, and sometimes that's kind of the narrative and the belief that we take in. Well, they're disappointed in me because I set a boundary. I said no. So therefore, I've done something wrong. And it doesn't mean you people will be disappointed in you. If, you know, I, I have made a couple you know, without thinking it through, oh, I'll meet you for coffee or this or that. And then like, it's like the day before. And I'm like, actually, I don't have anything more to give or to pour out. And I'll be like, you know, can we reschedule? And I'm sure there's some disappointment there. Um, but it doesn't mean I've done something wrong. I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure it out. Right. I'm trying to learn how to, like you said before, where are my yeses? Where are my no's? Right. But you know, I think it's a self-assessment. What keeps me saying no, right? Do I feel guilty? Um, do I have a core belief of they won't like me anymore? I'm not, you know, it's really a self-assessment of, you know, why is it, is it hard for you to right. say no? But most people, they don't want other people to be disappointed in that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I think it's easy as women to, to worry about that and to, and to, and to feel those things, but we are giving you permission, ladies, to assess what you need and give your permission, give yourselves permission to nap and also to reevaluate your priorities and, uh, and realize what is going to make your life work the best at this season of your life so that you can say yes, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And, and I, I, can I just say something real quick? Of course. Yeah. So before it goes out of my mind, (laughs) (laughs) true. Right. But like how, you know, if you, what your capacity is, the, the, our feelings and our emotions, we really need to, do a better job at tuning into how am I feeling emotionally? Our emotions will really help us to see what we have capacity for. Like, you know, we go through life and we don't really do emotion check-ins, right? But our emotions, like if you're feeling irritable or angry or resentful, like you need to lean into that and be like, what does this part of me, what is this part of me trying to tell me? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. That is so good. I actually started doing that 
to myself, why am I feeling angry all the time when I'm doing this thing? Or, and I realized at some, for some seasons of my life that I've been overextending myself. I was yeah. angry because I had to keep producing or, or meeting someone else's need. And I was like, okay, this is over my capacity. And yeah. that's why I'm angry. And so I need to go, you know, I'm reevaluating and I think I can't volunteer here anymore or whatever it is. Yeah. Or adjusting. Obviously, if you're mad that you have to cook dinner every night for your family, somebody needs to eat. But it's but you have to go, okay, how can we work together as a family unit so that I'm not bearing the load? You know, with a lot of women do bear the a lot of the load at home. And so how can we balance that where other people are participating and I don't feel resentful? That's just a little example, especially where you're resentful, angry or resentful. I feel like that sends huge red flags into, I might have a, a boundary issue here or I'm overdoing and I need to cut back a little. Yeah, let, let resentment be your guide. Like, don't go to this place of, well, I feel guilty if I feel resentful. Like, let those parts of yourself be. Just say, this is a part of me. My resentment part is like waving a flag at me and like tune into it and be like, what is it that you want to tell me? What is it that you want to show me? You can even sit and make a list of what am I feeling resentful about? What do I need to maybe let go so I can have the capacity for more? Or maybe there's like a fitness class you wanted to take or something over here you want to do, but you can't because, you know, you're doing these other things. So, you know, feeling um, hard emotions like anger and resentment, they really are our guide. They're not something to be afraid of or to feel guilty about. They really can be helpful to us. That's what they're there for. I love that you talked about that. And I think we'll probably have you back on the podcast to do a whole emotional assessment about lots of fun. Look at me. Oh, it's fun. fun <laughs> but I love it. Yeah. But it's really true that they're flags. And I think we need to start looking at those things as flags yeah. and not feeling ashamed or guilty that we have these feelings. And I think that's such a healthy perspective is looking at them as flags waving to go, hello, pay attention over here because this is a problem. So that's awesome. And we're going to stop there for today. Okay. But, but I want to ask you just before we go, a couple of things. One is just to wrap up this conversation, talking about our changing capacity. Can you give our audience two or three tips? If a woman was sitting across from you right now, two or three things that you would say, okay, from this point on, this is what I want you to think about. Do this, this, and this these top three things you would recommend a woman do if she feels like I am overwhelmed. I've not been evaluating my changing of capacity. I just know that I feel a wreck right now. What would you say yeah. to her? Yeah, I would probably say, so one of the tools, again, I'm always going to go back to emotions. Emotions are our guide. And there's a really wonderful tool out there called an emotion wheel. If you Google it, you could probably find it. But it's, it's really something you can take a picture of and you can keep it on your phone. And what I would say to her is I would like you every day to check in, check in in the morning. How do I feel emotionally midday at the end of the day? Start to really get in touch with what am I feeling emotionally? What is going on with me emotionally? So I would really have that assessment start with them and really do a check in. Another thing I would do is I would say, girlfriend, how are your boundaries? Do you, if you did a really honest self-assessment, do you need to take a look at where you need to have more efficient boundaries, right? Like I would say like, what is on your plate right now that maybe you need to be saying no to? Um, and I would say, does it feel scary for you to set boundaries with people? Is that something that's like really hard for you? Right. So checking in with emotions, how are your boundaries? How are you doing with with setting those boundaries? And the other thing I would say is, what are you doing for fun? What are you doing that you enjoy? What are you out there on the pickleball court? Like where what do you do for you? What are you doing that brings you life? That is life giving that brings you peace. What are you doing for fun? Are you having fun? We should still be having fun in life. There's still a little girl inside of us that wants to have fun and wants to be creative. What are you doing for you? 
Yes. Those might be three things off the top of my head that I might ask. Cause a lot of times I'm like, so what are you doing for you? What are you doing for fun? And they'll just kind of look at me like nothing. I don't think I'm doing anything right. And the beginning of this, I said, it's important at every age. I don't care if you're 95, we should always be seeking mastery, always developing new skills, looking for something new that we can accomplish and do because it just, it's good for us. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. And I'm going to say, ladies, you also can take a nap if you need one. <laughs> yes, I'm telling you, I'm ready for mom right now. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> well, listen, where can my guests find you online or on socials so they can, you know, keep up with yeah. what you're doing? I am on Instagram. What's your Instagram I handle? I think it's, if you just type in Melanie Eddy, you'll find me. And then I have a website, MelanieEddyCounseling.com, um, where I serve women in Pennsylvania, but I also offer life coaching, which I can do across state lines if that's something you're interested in as well. But that's where you can find me if you, you know, you want to check things out. Awesome. That's wonderful. Well, thanks so much for being here today. We loved having you on and I can't wait to have you on again. You're going to be a regular recurring guest. Well, I'm just, I'm excited about that. And as I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, Mel, make sure you take your own advice. I think that's. The- <laughs> so <laughs> true. So, so wow, true. That was good advice, Mel. Make sure you take it. So ladies, take the advice, do it and you're worth it. I hope you gleaned some new insights today as you listened to our conversation. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. You, my beautiful friend, are worth taking care of through midlife and beyond, but no one is going to do it for you. You must pay attention to your needs in this season and make space for them, whether that's a day off from work to have fun, lunch out with a friend, boundaries with your yeses, learning to say no, or taking a nap. (laughs) Just do it. You'll be glad you did. And don't feel guilty about it. If you enjoyed this episode, can I ask you again to review the podcast wherever you listen? Or if you've already reviewed the podcast, thank you so much. But would you share this episode with your female friends via social media, email, or a text? This is a perfect episode to share to help them in their midlife season. And it helps me to know that Midlife Crescendo is of value and worth continuing as we move into 2025. If the content is being shared and our listenership is growing, it helps women like you get the encouragement and information they need to make the second half of their life the best it can be. I so appreciate you being a part of our Midlife Crescendo journey together. Thanks for tuning in today. And remember, midlife is just a brand new season to find your passion and purpose for your grand finale. Talk next week.